Next item, please. Special Reports, Athlet Athletics, Mr. Abe Mischer. Okay, good evening, trustees, Dr. Wall, uh, <laughs> Jeff Del Judas, Athletic Director of Fortson High School, Jeff Conway, Athletic Director at Dearborn High, and uh, Mr. Chuck Silver, Athletic Director at Etzel Ford, and Scott Hummel, he's the middle school athletic director and oversees a lot of the athletic, athletic stuff when it comes to middle school and high school. Okay, so basically, just want to kind of talk, well, let me just start here, I guess. We just want to talk a little bit about our uh, sports programs, middle school and high school. First of all, we have uh, at all of our middle schools, all seven of our middle schools, we have uh, sports for boys and girls. We have actually, I think, one more for girls because we have competitive cheer and sideline cheer. Uh, we just started boys and girls soccer last spring. Boys and girls soccer was uh, absolutely terrific for our kids. We had great participation at all the schools and of all the sports. I would say that's the one sport that we had the most competitive balance in, in middle school soccer. Uh, we also, just so everyone knows, started uh, free soccer clinics throughout the, uh, throughout the city, and we're going to expand on it this year for our elementary students as well. Uh, that's a partnership with uh, PAL and, and anyone else, or just PAL? Just PAL, okay. So uh, that's some of the things we're doing in middle school. Uh, one of the things that we tried to do pre-pandemic was middle school wrestling. We tried to have a tournament. Obviously, the pandemic cut that. We had everything set up, but that was in 2020, so we obviously uh, canceled that. Something we're going to look to do again this year, hopefully, now that you know COVID numbers and so on are a little bit more in balance, although we've had a little spike lately. Um, but anyhow, we're going to try to do something with uh, middle school wrestling. They're just here for support, I guess. They don't want to, they don't want to speak at all. <laughs> uh, we, we anyhow, push. middle school combined, you see the numbers that we have. We have pretty good participation, really, in all of our sports. Some schools, some sports are a little bit lighter as far as total number of, uh, of people participating. But overall, like I said, soccer was, was great. Uh, boys and girls basketball uh, for, for both uh, JV and varsity, 7th, 8th grade. Well, actually, 6th, 7th. Uh, is the JV, and then the varsity would be eighth grade. We get great participation. Some of our football numbers are down, but that's also true not only in middle schools, but in most high schools, not only throughout the state, but throughout the country. Um, the football numbers with all the, uh, the concussion uh, you know, issues and so on, those numbers have been declining and you know, continue to decline overall, really. That's why here in the state of Michigan, a lot of people don't know, but we started even flag football leagues, seven on seven leagues and so on, as sponsored by some of our high schools. I don't wanna to read to you all the numbers, but you see we have a pretty good percentage. Nationwide, it's 38% of high school students participate in high school sports. I think we're either at or above that in pretty much all three high schools based on our enrollment. So. Um, and then if you compare our numbers to Livonia, which is a three, uh, three high school city, Plymouth Canton, which is three high school city, we're either at or more than them in, 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 uh, in a lot of the sports. And then the other thing too is sometimes the numbers, not sometimes, but the numbers you see here, they don't include, and the, the, the National Federation of High Schools, they, they compute it differently. So if uh, Jeff, for example, participates because he's such a, such a phenomenal athlete in football, <laughs> basketball, and baseball, they would count them as three. These numbers here just count the students as one. So sometimes our, like our three sport or two sport kids are, are only counted one time here. Um, the other re the, one of the other reasons, uh, again, that uh, the high school numbers are down in sports overall throughout the country is because a lot of more specialization in sports a lot of uh, athletes, parents of athletes are thinking that having them participate in one sport as opposed to, you know, specialize in that sport as opposed to two and three sports is becoming more and more common, unfortunately. And that's, I say unfortunately because it's my opinion that they should participate in all of them. But, <laughs> um, all right, so here are the middle school sports offerings that we have. Uh, we try and do the championship games at high schools. Uh, so... Uh, de depending on what the availability is at the, the, the high school facilities on those championship days is, is what we do. And we just try to go from Etzel to Dearborn to Fortson and just kind of spread it out uh, for the different sports just to try to 
kind of, you know, keep the kids, put them more on a big stage. And those games are usually very well attended by our middle school, uh, middle school students and, and supporters. So that's been going very well for us. So there's a lot to do uh, for us, and there's a lot we do to promote our sports programs. I'm not going to read you every bullet point, but one of the most common things that we do is at open houses, we'll have you know the high school coaches, and, and it's not anything that's required of them, but the athletic directors will put out an email, say, hey, your open house is coming soon. If you want to reserve a little area in your building to kind of come and promote your programs, uh, you know, to the new students especially, but to everybody. Uh, that's, you know, that's one thing that they can do. The other thing is uh, high school coaches will go to the middle schools and kind of talk about their program when they're doing the orientation there for the eighth graders who are going to be incoming ninth graders. Uh, that's something else. Uh, these guys are a lot more uh, savvy with social media than I ever will be, uh, but they're great on social media. They're constantly putting updates out there, um, highlighting some of our athletes that get scholarships and so on, highlighting our sports teams that are doing well. And even, you know, putting information out there for our, some of our sports teams that are struggling, but they get a big win. They do a great job in promoting it and so on. Um, but look, at the end of the day, every coach is responsible to promote their program. That's, you know, I mean, they, they have to take initiative and they have to kind of sell their program to the community. And the better that coaches do that, generally speaking, the more participation they get. So that's, uh, that, you know, that's a big part of it. There's got to be culpability when it comes to coaches as well. Um, again, this is just a few of the other things that we did. I already spoke about the soccer uh, that we did with PAL this past year, and then the championship games for the middle schools and so on at the, at the high school facilities. Um, the other thing that we've been doing a much better part of, uh, job of, rather, our coaches have been doing a much better job of as clinics and camps for, for their schools, for their programs. So um, I know uh, Coach Beidun at Ford runs a free clinic for his basketball program. We run a clinic at Dearborn High for, for, our, for our basketball program, our football program. Uh, Fordson uh, runs a very low-cost clinic, I know that, for their basketball programs as well. And uh, they're starting to do more, more for uh, for the uh, the the uh, like some of the clinics. All of them are are for both boys and girls. But we're trying to get that out to to some of the other sports as well that haven't been doing that. Uh, when you look at athletic departments, there's a lot of things that that go into you know having a very successful athletic department. And when you look at again the National Federation of High Schools and some of, some of the things that they talk about, and this is. A lot of this information is from their website and from these guys going to uh, different conferences and so on. Um, when, when they talk about having great high school sports, the first thing they talk about is upgrading facilities. Um, and I don't want to get too much into that. I think everyone here knows how I feel about our facilities and what we need to do. Um, but another very important piece is winning. People want to be part of winning programs. If you look at the college level, for example, when Alabama wins a national championship in football, or, or you know, well, pretty much football because they don't do anything else, but when they win a national championship in football, the amount of enrollment or applications for enrollment in Alabama skyrockets. When Michigan had a great football season last year, the amount of people who applied to the University of Michigan goes up exponentially. So that's, that's just the reality. People want to be part of winning programs. I mean, if you just look at our pro sports, I remember everybody, uh, Mason was a huge Red Wings fan. I haven't seen her wear a Red Wings shirt in about 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you win, people are going to come and support you and so on. So and the reason I bring that up is I used to pick on Mason all the time. Told her she don't know the first thing about hockey, but she has more Red Wings attire than Steve Eiserman. But <laughs> anyways, um, you know, getting non-athletes to attend games is a big part of it, but that's a struggle. That's another thing, like gate money, gate receipts are down, not only, again, in, in our city and state, but throughout the country. And that's, again, because this, uh, this era of, of kids have so much going on. There's so much for them to do. Um, you know, unfortunately, they're on their phones a lot, so they're, they're entertained in other ways. And, and so that, that having, uh, you know, attendance at football games with, 2,000 people or whatever on a consistent basis, those, that doesn't happen much anymore. You'll get it at big games, but overall, you don't, you know, you don't see it from, from week to week. Uh, celebrating our athletes, that's something we really, uh, I think, have done a much better job of the last, maybe, I would say, again, take COVID away the last two or three years. Um, but that's something we're going to continue to try and do better. Um, you know, some of the different things that the schools are doing. If you walk in the Fortson gym today and you hadn't been there for five years, you'll see a huge difference. 
with the branding and the different thing, the things that Fortson has done there. Dearborn High not only had it inside, but this year has uh, put their branding outside and so on to try to enhance the look of it and, and that type of thing. Uh, Mr. Silver has already started doing some things at Edsel Ford. I know Bob actually started, Bob Picano, former athletic director, has started some things there in the hallways and so on with the branding and that type of thing. And then, like I said, just celebrating our athletes a little bit more. Uh, that's something that we're looking to do different things with as well. Uh, supporting coaches, all four of these uh, gentlemen do a great job of supporting all our coaches. They always have, all of our coaches always have the opportunity to go to any clinics that are out there pretty much. Uh, we pay for the clinics, we pay for, you know, some of the, if it requires a hotel stay, we pay for that. We do whatever we can to try and do, and do that. Obviously, we don't want them missing instruction, so usually the clinics that we'd like them to go to are in the summertime. Um, sometimes they're in the fall, like I know the BCAM basketball clinic is coming up here in early October, um, but that's at Oakland University, and it's on a weekend. It's Friday, Saturday, so uh, or Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday. So again, you know, we, we don't want to pull people out of classrooms, but at the same time, we want to offer them the opportunity to get better. So we're, we're constantly you know, sending them different things in that, uh, so that they can you know, understand what's out there and, and try to work on improving at their craft. Um, just a few other ways that we, you know, we try to promote athletics. Uh, our student athletes are fantastic at participating in community service projects, uh, you know, like the backpack drive that we just uh, had. Uh, I know the Amity Foundation had a backpack drive. A lot of our student athletes were there helping get, getting uh, materials and backpacks and so on. Um, Zaman has got an event coming that our, some of our teams will participate in, uh, the, the walk, um, walk run uh, uh, thing that they do every year at Ford Field. Um, are they, they're constantly going out during March's reading month, reading to the elementary kids, and the elementary kids love it. You know, they see these guys come in and, you know, they're larger than life, some of them. They, you know, just, obviously there's a lot of growth between them and... And, uh, you know, I know we had uh, Rana, who uh, played basketball at Fortson and is playing Div uh, Division uh, Two basketball and having a great career. She came back and spoke to students at Miller and Fortson, where she went to school. Uh, Dearborn High has people coming in doing the same thing as well. Uh, so any way we can, we try to, again, promote, you know, promote the sports with, uh, with our young, young ones. Uh, just some pictures here from... Uh, from uh, the, the PAL program that we ran last year. And like I said, uh, we, you know, we got a late start with it last year, but we're gonna look to expand and so on from, from uh, on it this year. Uh, and then if you have any questions, they will have to answer them because <laughs> I did everything else here, so. Anybody have any questions? I, I have a couple. Um, sure. So the first thing is that you had mentioned that the middle schoolers sometimes will have their games at the high school to expose them to that. Are we doing the same thing for high school students in terms of the collegiate stadiums and arenas? Because I saw just re recently that Fortson was at, Fortson was at Michigan Stadium. Yeah, we just played at Michigan. But outside of the football, are we doing other sports at other places? Yeah, I, I know like last year, Dearborn and Etzel played at the Toledo Mudhead Stadium. Um, we're looking at doing something for softball this year too. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're trying to do some of those things. Um, Wrestling. <laughs> Wrestling at Ferris State? I didn't know about that. <laughs> um, I, no, um, we're looking at, at expanding and doing some different things. A lot of times the athletic facilities at the college, if it coincides at the same season, it's kind of hard to do that. Okay. If it's softball season, it's hard to get in at U of M. Um, but we're looking at some different venues. Do you ever get a chance then for vice versa for those college athletes to come here to speak to the students? I know you had mentioned the one... Um, female uh, basketball player that was that came back my experience with it has been mainly like our our former athletes coming back to you know Etzel graduates Dearborn graduates Fortson graduates coming back to school to their their school okay uh, have we had anybody else from outside of that yeah uh, in the KLA conference they have a leadership summit every three times a year uh, once in the fall, in the winter, and the spring, and, and often they'll bring in college athletes to speak to all our whole league. We'll each get to send six, eight, ten kids, and the whole league gets together. We're having one. When is it? Yeah, Tony Mandrich. And Tony Mandrich from Michigan State came in last year to talk about drugs and alcohol abuse. And um, with this one's uh, the 26th. We're having another speaker come in. And it's a good thing because it gets all the kids from all the schools together 
in our league. So it, it promotes not only that competitive part of it, but the fact that we're all in this together in a certain way. So, okay. um, And then the other thing is, um, is there any collaboration between um, the Dearborn Rec, I'm sp thinking specifically like the, the softball uh, rec that they have and the high schools and the middle schools? Is there any collaboration there or is it just... You're talking about like little league, uh, like right? So, so like at Dearborn High, they like uh, Dearborn baseball. He's our baseball field. Right. He's our softball field. Um, you know, we we are probably at a point now where we share some common coaches that are able to work back and forth and stuff like that. We have other recreation programs as well, like okay. the tennis program uses our tennis courts in the summertime. We have DRD uses our pool, so we see a lot of recreation programs okay. coming in and out of our buildings for various reasons. Uh, you know, some have um, you know more of a long-standing relationship, and others will just maybe rent out our gym for a, for a clinic or something like that. Okay. So a little bit of both. Okay, and then the last thing, um, you know, I think this is getting more and more national attention. Um, but what steps are we doing to make sure that Title IX, that we're getting equal um, playing opportunities for our, for our girls in all of these sports? Yeah, good question. So uh, let me touch on a little bit on the question you asked before with regards to collaboration. One of the things that we talked about when we were asked you know, to do a presentation a little bit about sports and so on was having maybe like, you know, uh, the Dearborn baseball teams come to a baseball game or whatever and invite them to a baseball game and just kind of say, oh, here we have, you know, the 12-year-old team, Cincinnati Reds or whatever their team name is and so on, just to do some of that a little bit more. With regards to Title IX, again, we actually have more girls sports than we do boys sports. Uh, the funding for both sports is the same, uh, the amount of funding that we get, you know, for, for each sport. Um, you know, with certain things like football, Football and ice hockey, both boys sports, of course, but they're both very expensive sports. So, you know, like helmets, uh, the cost of helmets and reconditioning and so on. So, yes, we do allocate a little bit more money when it comes to football. Football is kind of like its own entity, and so is hockey, again, because of the equipment. Although hockey, a lot of the players paid for uh, some of their equipment, right? Uh, or no? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. So, um, anyhow, uh, with regards to Title IX, there's, there are no – like when uh, – uh, boys basketball goes to Traverse City at Dearborn High. Girls basketball also goes to Traverse City for Dearborn High for that trip. Uh, 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 Chuck talked about our baseball team uh, going and playing a game at the Mud Hens. We're also looking for our softball team to do that. But so much of this, again, I will tell you, and I'm not putting coaches out there in a bad way, I promise you, but because our coaches work very, very hard. But if they you know, say, hey, there's this really cool event. Like this year, actually, uh, Jeff, we did the cross-country thing. And it was boys and girls that went to Toledo and ran under the lights, right? Wasn't it Toledo? Or, yeah, St. John's, which is next to Toledo. So St. John's, Ohio, this guy's getting very specific on me, like geography class here. <laughs> so you're a math teacher, by the way. Uh, so anyway, so you have... <laughs> So, so we, you know, we, we do anything when it comes to, you know, when it comes to all those things. And, we, you know, we try... We tr just as much as we promote the boys' sports, we promote the girls' sports. It's not like we're, you know, uh, doing anything different there. Whatever the needs are, like, they'll call me and they'll say, hey, listen, I don't really have a whole lot of money for this, but I, we really need whatever it may be. And uh, fortunately, the good Dr. Wall here gives me enough money here for, for a little latitude to kind of support some of those things. So we make sure that everything is taken care of, I promise you there. Trustee Barry? Oh, go I was going to say, a lot of, like... Abe was talking about a lot of it's coach driven too. Like we we try to accommodate whatever coaches want to do. If we need to do some fundraising or try to figure out creative ways to to finance something, um, we very rarely say no to anything. Um, a lot of times we'll run it by Abe. He's been very supportive. We'll talk to Tom Wall about it. He's very supportive, but we try to make it work. So and. and not to put coaches on the spot, but a lot of it is coach initiated, you know, whether it's a Toledo Mud Hens game or, or whatever else. But we try to support in any way we can. Just let me touch on that real quick. So this this uh, past fall like or, or summer, actually, like uh, volleyball, fall sports start really in, the, you know, in the, in the summertime, if you will. So volleyball wanted to do uh, a team building camp. So, you know, they would take the girls or, you know, and go on like on a little trip or whatever and so on and kind of do their team building thing. It was approved. And 
you know, boys football didn't ask to do that. So obviously it wasn't approved. So it's, it's like, you know, like we're saying, it's coach driven. If coaches come to us and say, hey, we want to do this or try to do whatever, you know, we're all in. We never tell, you know, the girls, no, you can't go or whatever. If the trip makes sense, we're all in for it. Trustee Barry? Going back to uh, Trustee Watt's question about the partnership between you know, public schools and uh, administration, it's been an amazing partnership. Uh, we have many, many parent-run organizations, programs, if it's basketball, football, soccer, swimming, many, many sports, they get, we, get to, you know, we, get, we get to use the facilities of the own public schools and you know, all, all three athletic directors are very welcoming there. So I can speak on behalf of the Dearborn Youth Football. I already reached out to athletic director, Mr. Conway, and we're gonna set up a date at a home game where our football players are out there on the field welcoming the, you know, the Dearborn High team. And I'm gonna be reaching out to uh, Mr. Silver for maybe have the cheerleaders out there at the same time. So it's been a great, well, Fortune's always been very welcoming. So that, that works out great. But the point I wanted to make, and I'm gonna plant a seed here, I tried doing it at Henry Ford College a few years ago. We just, you know, we just put in a plug for another university. And a few years ago, there was a community college that was advertising in our, in our district for camps. Uh, have we ever, or did we ever talk about maybe doing camps at Henry Ford College? And we're not talking about just basketball, you know, basketball or football. Other sports that we want to give more attention to, like for example, cheerleading, gymnastics, volleyball, wrestling. And it could be a citywide uh, event. Has that ever been discussed with Henry Ford College? Uh, I know when I brought it up, I know the answer. You don't, you don't have to buy it. I know the answer. I'm just planting that seed that why not? We have these facilities instead of, you know, forcing them doing their thing here. And I know it broke all of our hearts when the gymnastics program went away at Edsel Ford. What are we going to do to try to, you know, get these sports going again? Especially sports like uh, you know, gymnastics and uh, the wrestling. I know we tried doing something at the, at the middle school, bad timing with COVID, but I remember one of my boys, it was just that one day wrestling tournament at Fortson High School, all of a sudden he had a beautiful career at Fortson as a wrestler. So these are the things that we need to be doing. So maybe uh, Mr. Mishra, if you can reach out to somebody at Henry Ford College and maybe have that discussion. Yeah, so just to, uh, Piggyback a little bit off what uh, Trustee Barry said with regards to some of the sports. So if you look at the NFHS, NFHS and, and the sports that are declining in number, like I said, football is a, one that was uh, declining rapidly. Although there was all kinds of studies about baseball and the age of baseball and softball spectators going up, baseball and softball numbers actually have been increasing very slightly at the, in, in most high schools, again, throughout the country. Hockey is, is very much down. And again, some of the reasons for it, uh, for first and foremost, as let's speak about hockey, is the, the fact of the, the expense at young ages. So a lot of kids are not getting into hockey at a young age and, or being able to uh, continue to stay in hockey um, and, you know, as, they, as they get older. So their passion, I guess, for the sport or their, their interest in the sport kind of dies down a little bit. And that's something that we, we uh, obviously experienced here this year because we had a hockey team, but the numbers just kept con continually decreased uh, year after year after year. And then the other thing that you know you have to take into account as well is the change in demographics. So uh, certain demographics enjoy playing certain sports a little bit more. You know, I mean, we're seeing it here in our own city with soccer. Soccer didn't used to be as big as it is now, but it's continually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's you know, so we just as a district need to adapt and, and try to do what we can to uh, to support the families that we have. Yeah, thank you to all athletic directors. You guys do an amazing job, especially with uh, you know the sizes of our high schools. And just for the record, you're going to be here all night. We're trying to stall. We're trying to avoid the next action items. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one. one um, last Trustee question. D'Ambrosio had oh, his hand up, so oh. just a moment, and I'll get to you, Trustee Mosip. Well, you, you've answered my question because it was about unified hockey, and so I'm okay with your explanation. <clears throat> Thanks, Trustee Mosip. I know we had a some kind of a paid study by a parent on improving the football teams. It was suggested maybe we can look at even other teams. H has that gone further? Are we looking at those feedback of improving all teams in all high schools? Can you go? Oh. Well, I think we're constantly trying to improve our teams. 
I mean, the way we go about hiring coaches and recruiting coaches, I think, is the way we, we, we do that. Um, you know, unfortunately, the Little League is kind of dwindled, like Abe was talking about, and we're, not, we're just not seeing as much interest. Well, you wouldn't know it by my numbers in football, obviously. We have 150, 160 kids still out for football. Um, but I, I think that's, a, that's an ongoing battle that we're fighting. And any athletic director worth his salt is going to be doing that stuff on a daily basis. So I'm not sure about the study you're talking about or anything like that, but I think we're constantly trying to review what we do and how to do it better, just like teachers and everybody else. So, right. you know, I think that's, that's a given. Any AD that you're, you talk to is going to say, hey, how can we get this better? So I think we're still doing it. You might have to answer that a little bit. Sure. I think um, Etzel Forge probably had the least success in the last few years, obviously. Um, and I think one of the things we're trying to do is make sure the kids have a positive, good experience. And what, what we have in our school is we get a lot of kids who come out late, okay? We have over 90 kids in our football program right now, which is the most that we've had in a while, mm -hmm. um, which is a positive thing, but a lot of those kids haven't played before. And now they're just getting their first experience. So I think one of the things in, with my job is to make sure our coaches are providing a positive experience that the, those kids will come back and get excited, get to the weight room, do the off-season stuff, and that they come back year after year. So next year we're over 100 um, and we'll slowly become more and more competitive in our conference. I mean, that's the, the goals. Um, and, and obviously... Um, for me personally, I coached football at Etzel Ford for 15 years, so that's something that's near and dear to my heart, and I want to see it be successful. Um, and obviously, like at, at Fortson, you've had, you know, 60 years of really good football. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're kind of in a different, um, different spots right now, but we all have our challenges, um, and we're just looking to... Number one, first and foremost, just make sure the kids have a good experience. Let me just say about that, too. I don't want to single out any particular school, but we have one of our schools in particular that has been having their coaches go watch coaches in other programs in other cities even. So, you know, it's, it might be difficult for a Fortson coach to go watch an Etzel practice and, you know, to try to pick up from there. They might feel a little uneasy, if you will, about it, but... You know, there's obviously a lot of good coaches throughout the state in, in various sports. So we're having our coaches go in, watch their, their teams practice, and then sit down with the head coaches and assistant coaches just to get some ideas and build their knowledge base. Trustee Wall, I think. I mean, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> Mr. Wall, I think, okay. had a question. Thank you for the Dr. Wall, but I don't have that honorific <laughs> title for doctor. I have other initials, but not doctor. But thank and now you. you're trustee, too. But I want to thank you, gentlemen. You guys are great advocates for the program. Every time I've come across the issue, you guys have been very welcoming, creative. So I want to thank you for all your hard work and your years of experience. You guys work a lot of extra hours in the evening, and, and you guys enjoy it. So President I don't know about your families, but I think you do. Sorry, I, I had requested this presentation a couple of months ago after we had gotten the note about the closing of the ice hockey program. And we've also seen numbers dwindle in some of the other high school sports. No different than when we heard the music to pro, uh, programs talking about dwindling numbers because of middle school. And I know that there's only so many middle school sports that we can do here in a district, but that's where I think there's a lot of other community groups that we can be reaching out to to promote it. One thing I heard from several of you was it's on the coaches to promote it. And I don't disagree. However, we see turnover with the coaches. And my assumption is the athletic directors or the school administration, it's on their shoulders as well. This isn't just about coaches. We know that a good coach or a good advisor can build or, or kill a program really quickly. So we can't have it just be on one person's shoulders. So I would encourage all of the groups, ADs and everyone else, do what you can to support all these, all these students. Thanks. Thank you. One thing that I just want to add, and I love the point that um, Trustee Berry made, was uh, about the partnership with HFC, because it's obviously a good partnership, and we're always looking at ways of, uh, of um, enhancing that. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Rochelle Taylor, but she is the athletic director. Are you? Yes. Yes, I used to coach at Henry Ford for 25 years. Oh, <laughs> well, see, I'm, I'm out of the loop then. I'm not the biggest sports oh, yeah, fan here. Yeah, he was a basketball <laughs> coach there. But uh, 
just reach out and see where we can we can make uh, connections there that would be beneficial to all of our students in both the district and the college. Absolutely. So. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Appreciate you're it. You're welcome. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> Next item, please. Citizen participation. Citizens wishing to address the board on agenda and non-agenda items for action were assigned in by 7.10 p.m. by submitting a blue card to the board secretary may speak at this time. The board may not be in a position to respond to non-agenda items, non-agenda items. Therefore, speakers should not anticipate an immediate response to their comments or questions. For the benefit of all concerned, do not mention the names of students or school district employees. Please keep your comments as brief as possible. The board president reserves the right to limit times. The first person who would like to speak is Ms. Emily Giordano. She would like to come to speak to the board about inappropriate material in the schools. Okay, I am going to limit us to three minutes per comment just because we do have quite a few comments and we're already running long. So I appreciate your time. Okay, I will make it quick. My name is Thank Emily you. Giordano. I'm a mother. We have six children. Um, three have gone through the Dearborn Public Schools. Three are currently in the Dearborn Public Schools. Um, regarding the post that you all were referencing and the videos that we've all seen, not just here, but in other school districts, I've been involved in board meetings at the Wald Lake Public School System. Um, I'm involved with the Livonia parent group, um, all through the communities, all through not only our state, but through our country, the stuff that is happening within the schools is disturbing. And if you aren't all appalled, then you are part of the problem. What I heard earlier, it sounded a lot like passing the buck, like, oh, well, this wasn't us. It was because they had access through this online system. If that's the case, then my concern would be if this happened as of 2020, for two years, students have had access to information, books that are 100% inappropriate, not age appropriate, even if they're curated for K through 12. If you've seen the amount of literature coming through that is approved for K through 12, I don't want any of my daughters reading that, not until they're grown adults. Um, as educators, as administrators, as people on the board, it is your duty to protect our children. I did not grow up in Dearborn. I moved here. I moved here. I've always felt very safe here, being that the culture is very traditional and it aligns with my Catholic upbringing. Um, the position that my husband and I are in now, if we find that there is merit to what is happening, we're pulling our kids. We're not going to stay in the public school sector. So that's what I have to say. I am concerned. I understand if there is no response, but that is what I came to say. I appreciate you listening to me. And I, once again, apologize. I'm not a public speaker. I'm just a mom trying to find out what's really happening and looking out for my daughters. So thanks. Thank you for your time. Next, Samuel Gomez would like to come to speak from Dearborn. would like to come to speak to the board about removing explicit book from schools, libraries, about being okay to be gay. Moving along, Ms. Rob, Rob. Ms. Rob. Together, I was with her, I just step out, but I was pretty much the same thing, what I needed to say. Okay, thank you. Next, Ms. Robin Macklin would like to come to speak from Dearborn, would like to come to speak to the school board about school book selections, representing her three children. Hi. Um, so first of all, I just want to, I didn't come to speak about this specifically, but um, just with respect to Title IX and um, sports, um, I think that Title IX is subtle and it goes beyond just having the same number of women's and men's sports. And if you did a word cloud for, because uh, I, I think Trustee Thorpe asked last time for uh, um, information about sports other than just football and basketball. But if you did a word cloud of that last presentation, it was all football. I heard football like a lot of times. So I, I also think female representation in our administration is important. Um, so I just encourage all of you to maybe take a, a good hard look and make sure that we're, we really are providing 
equal opportunity in terms of like experience, not just the not not just the budget that we allocate, but the number of coaches that we have, the experience of those coaches. You know, and 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 it's not just on those coaches um, to make sure that the the experience and the opportunity is the same. So um, I'll say that first. Um, my second thing that I wanted to talk about, well, really the, the primary thing, um, is that the ideal purpose of public schools is to educate children how to critically think and engage with society and democracy. That means that our schools are required to educate children from different backgrounds and belief systems. To have a greater say over curriculum, we have private schools and we have homeschooling options. I think that some of the language that I've been seeing on social media and that you're probably going to hear tonight is very inflammatory. Mis misdirected, and it's very strategic also. It's, it's, it's very strategic and inflammatory. Um, those books weren't physically in the library. They were part of a consortium. Um, that's, that's one thing that I don't think was very clear um, in a lot of the things I've seen on social media. And I also just want to say that I'm opposed to any parent committees and parent involvement in choosing the appropriateness of books in our school libraries. I didn't elect anyone on this parent review committee. I elected my school board representatives, who in turn hire the superintendent, who in turn hire educators, who have been, who have gone to college, who have, have learned um, the appropriate way to, to choose books. And I just think a parent committee is punting responsibility as well. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, Ms. Mary Lane from Dearborn would like to speak to the board about libraries, censorship, and access. Congratulations on having 300,000 titles. That's really amazing. Uh, thank you also, Trustee Petchlikoff, for a really great quote from the US Supreme Court. I totally agree with that. And uh, of course, it's not only important if I agree. That's a law of the land. So I want to say that freedom to read is one of our most important American rights. Uh, it comes implicitly from freedom of the press. What good is a free press if no one reads, no one writes, or no one publishes? It's our birthright as Americans, and free libraries are another birthright that we have. It comes from, uh, it's widely credited to Benjamin Franklin. Besides our freedom to read, uh, we know that censorship is very dangerous. The number of people, authors, who have been censored is really ridiculous. The countries that censor books are totalitarian, authoritarian, communist regimes. They censor heavily. History is replete with examples of bad censorship. Usually it's done to protect people or for supposedly for the public good. But the best public good is wide access. For example, Mark Twain, Shakespeare, the Merriam-Webster Webster Dictionary, uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales, Tales of the Arabian Nights, uh, even Harry Potter, people have censored or tried to censor these. Uh, no one has a right to censor for someone else, except a parent for their child. As public officials, it's your duty to try to maintain as wide access to information as possible. I applaud Dearborn Schools for making public books, books available widely. And I urge you to get that right back to our students as soon as possible. I thank the Dearborn City Library and Wayne Risa also for making books available. The coders for the library, the city, Wayne Risa, American Library Association, or Overdrive should be able to limit for parents what access any particular student can have to books. Uh, I would urge you to rely on them to do that and implement a system where the parents who don't want their kids to read something, they screen because you cannot screen all the number of books that come through any system. The parents can censor the books. They can also uh, refuse access to their <coughs> students for the libraries. I wouldn't recommend that because that will not create a good citizen. Uh, 
May I, I urge you to wrap up your comments, yep. please? Thank you. I urge you to stay with your process because it's a good process. It's done well over the years. I ask you to return access to the library. You have a great website. Great things are happening in Dearborn schools. Thank you for returning biking and walking to school and so many other good things you do. Thanks. Thank you. Next, Ms. Stephanie Butler would like to speak about books and she's taking crystal time. Hold on, before you begin, do I have a blue card from Crystal? Uh, you should have a blue card for Crystal. I don't well, we, we weren't informed we needed to fill out one separately. Yes, I'll yield my three minutes to Stephanie if there's not one for Crystal. I was going to say I don't have one for Stephanie. That's fine, I'll yield mine possibly. Okay, thank you. Dear community members and school board, my name is Stephanie and I'm a mother of four children and a daughter of the Dearborn community. I ask to be listened to as I express the concerns of many parents in this diverse community. I believe that pornography and rape culture have no place in our schools. And to my disbelief, after a year, my mic's cut off. Want to fix the mic? I don't think it's cut off. We might be having some technical difficulties. Can you see if it's speaking it again? Hello? OK. Yeah, it's working. I believe that pornography and rape culture have no place in our schools. And to my disbelief, after a year of looking into what is being made available at our school libraries, I came across a book titled This is Gay and another one called uh, The How-To Guide for Sex. This book is a wasteland of tips on how to join adults on hookup sites and thus get raped. It also has tips on how to engage in same-sex sexual acts and rather than being a book classic, it belongs in trash cans and not in our beloved library, staring our kids in the face. Upon further review, I found another gem, an explicit book with depictions of drinking semen from bottles and contemplation of suicide. While our kids are increasingly confused about their very existence and suicide in adolescence is on the rise, schools should be protecting our children, not grooming them for a life of trauma, hypersexuality, and moral decay. This is not an attack on people's personal choices and lifestyle, but a call to action for parents to say enough of this imposed fear of speaking out, especially when our children's lives are at stake. I am not a crusader against books that depict diverse lives, ethnicities, or ideas, but I sure as hell am against smut being presented to our kids as appropriate reading material. I believe we must meet the following objectives. Identify who is ordering and allowing those books into the library in our school district. Remove all sexually explicit, detailed, I, I don't even call these books, these are manuals, okay? These aren't LGBT teen romance novels. These are how-to guides. Telling our kids to go on adult sex apps. Do any one of you, would you want your kids to go on that? Would you want your kids to, your grandkids on, on Grindr? Honestly, I mean, this is a no brainer. We are not talking about regular books here as this district is trying to portray. And to blatantly sit up here and lie to this community and say that these books were not found physically is a bold faced lie to which I have multiple evidence. I'll pass the mic. Peace be upon you all. My name is Kassim Osegar. I'm a product of this uh, school system, K through eight. I went to Lori Elementary and Middle School and then went to Fortson High School, graduated my way on to a track and field scholarship to Rochester University, a private Christian college. Graduated two degrees, psychology and biology. And um, I do admit, I have not been coming to these meetings, but I guess this was a wake up call for me to come here and, and just let you know that as individuals, we have to understand that people have different views, different ideologies, different uh, mentalities they ascribe to. But uh, I, I do, I do want to say that 
allowing our children to reach these books before they hit the age of puberty, before they, before they can understand what life is, as Stephanie said, um, is an injustice to our students. And um, I am not telling you know, anyone here that we have to be closed-minded and only believe in our religious beliefs or our moral beliefs, and we cannot go outside that box. But there is a clear, distinct line as to what uh, even individuals, myself at the age of 24, can and cannot read. And if our students are not able to make those decisions, and if the parents of our students who are giving money to keep, these, uh, to keep these schools open and to keep these programs running do not have a say, then what kind of school system are we in? Lastly, I must point out, if people, authors, who do not believe in the religions they are talking about in these books, if they have, um, if they are allowed to write about this kind of stuff, and if they are allowed to talk about religion, why are we not allowed to include religious books in our libraries? Why are we not allowed to let our children know that as much as school is important, religion is a guiding factor in their life? I say these words with peace, and I hope you guys take my words into account. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Rolo Mackey, and I just moved to Dearborn a month ago. Um, and this is actually my first school board meeting because I have a two and a half year old at home, and uh, I would like my two and a half year old to eventually grow up and um, be a product of the Dearborn school system just as I was. Um, but there were a few things that stood out to me today uh, during this discussion, and um, one of the things that was said today was, we are here to prepare children for the future. And it's incidentally, today I saw on Facebook a post that was, uh, Wayne County School State Assessment Results for the Math 21-22 school year. Uh, Dearborn Schools is at 32.98% in advanced and proficiency. And other cities, Northville, 72%, Canton, Plymouth, Canton, 56%. So I just wonder, what are we gonna have to do? What are we gonna work towards to prepare our kids for the future with such test scores here? So um, I also saw this post on Facebook and it alerted me to, you know, to speak out against it. And I don't know how this is an educational book when it, I, I'm so embarrassed to even say this because there's people, there's, there's a kid here. So I, I, I'm just really, I'm really distraught, my heart is shaking just looking at these. I can't imagine a minor looking at these, somebody with an, you know, a brain that's not fully developed. And I, you know, hopefully I have a fully developed brain after seeing this, but I just, um, I just wanna know how this book made it into the library and how we can prevent books like this in the future from making it out there too. Thank you for your comments.